thank you so much, Whitney. That was an amazing greeting. Okay, I'm just going to um, open up my screen. Can you see everything okay? Okay, excellent. I am so excited. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart for the past 20 years. Um, and also RAM is near and dear to my heart. So it's a huge honor to present this to you today. And this is a dove key, by the way. I have a few quick slides about wild care, who we are and what we do. Um, so we are a wildlife rehabilitation hospital located in East Ham on Cape Cod. And our mission is to treat sick, injured and orphaned native wildlife for uh, release. And uh, we want them to be capable of independent survival. We are a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit organization, and we treat over 1,800 animals per year. We have a consulting veterinarian who comes to our site several times a week to assist us, and I have an amazing staff of eight. We do a ton of education and outreach because it's critically important, um, and so we are helping to prevent wildlife casualties, and we are teaching people how to coexist with wildlife. A really important part of the work that we do is we operate a wildlife emergency helpline. And what this is, is it's a phone number where people can call us 365 days per year uh, if, and ask us questions if they have wildlife in distress or if they have a human wildlife conflict. And last year alone, we received over 10,000 phone calls. And I love to share that number because to me, it shows me the value of our work and also the necessity. There's a tremendous need there. Our facility is located on Cape Cod, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we're located here in East Ham. And um, as you can see, I love being on Cape Cod because we're surrounded by water, and I especially love the seabirds. And um, so our facility is busting, bustling with activity throughout the year, and we receive a lot of aquatic birds. This is our very important um, raptor aviary, and we call it our elliptical aviary because it's elliptical in shape. I love to show this photo because it's bigger than our main clinic building, <laughs> and I think you can probably see this facility from the moon. And the reason it's so important is because um, it's a very large uh, structure, and it has three inner aviaries and an outer aviary that forms a continuous loop. So birds like this, oops, excuse me, birds like this red-tailed hawk um, can take continuous flight in this outer chamber. And so it makes it um, very true to life for getting them conditioned for life back out in the wild. Super important building for us. And with all those aquatic birds that we receive, um, of course, we couldn't survive without our therapy pools. And so we have these two lovely pools. Um, we have the ability to heat one of them and we can make them saline or freshwater. And so I feel like sometimes some of these birds um, never want to leave. It's a day spa for wildlife. <laughs> and what animals do we treat at Wild Care and why? Um, so we see animals primarily for three reasons. They're either orphaned, injured, or diseased. And we largely see birds. Over 70% of what we receive are wild birds. But we also treat small mammals, reptiles, and wild amphibians. And um, something I feel we're known for that I am very proud of is we have a designated baby bird program. And so we have over 40 trained volunteers who do three hour shifts once per week um, for a period of six months. And they come in and they help us to feed and clean our baby birds. And you can see last year we received over 489 avian orphans, most of those songbirds um, needing at least um, 12 to 14 hours a day of care. And so we could not do it without our amazing volunteers and interns. And I think this is my last wild care slide. Um, it's an, an important one because uh, last year we received 1,812 animals and over 70% of these animals came to us because they were impacted negatively by people. And you're going to see this is a common, a common um, a theme in this presentation today. But here are just some of the examples of the major reasons we receive animals. Um, primarily, uh, orphans make up the bulk of what we do, and orphans come in for all sorts of reasons, as you very well know. Cat interaction, dog interaction, habitat destruction. Life is hard if you, if you are a wild animal. 
And so before I start my presentation, I just need to say, I feel so incredibly grateful to live on Cape Cod and to live in Massachusetts where we love our wildlife. People flock here um, because we have um, rich diversity of, of animals um, in the air, on the land and in the sea. And Massachusetts alone has over 170 wildlife rehabbers. And I personally feel very proud to know you and to work with you. So thank you. We live in a good place. So um, now to the, the topic. So rehabbers, um, you are all incredibly amazing and inspiring people. Um, when I think about what we do, we really are the unsung everyday heroes and we often go unrecognized. To me, we are the wildlife nurses. And I put together a list. I thought about, you know, what is, who is a rehabber? And we are knowledgeable. We often have to know, um, you know, behavioral characteristics and diet and the needs of many, many different species. We are selfless people, um, sometimes leaving ourselves behind because we are caring so much for others and for animals. We're typically generous, kind, and compassionate. We are definitely multitaskers, and I would say that many of us thrive on chaos, and we would have to because it's the nature of our work, which is emergency-based. Um, many of us are crazy, and I hope you don't mind saying that, myself included. Um, we'd have to be um, to do this amazing work. But also we, we provide, we are an important public face um, for the community and we, we provide important community and public health and safety services. But also um, we experience compassion fatigue. You know, this is a field of work where it never ends. There's always a need. And even though we're making a difference, there will continue to be a need. And sometimes we may feel, oh my goodness, we can't save them all. And I plan to make you feel better about that in this presentation. Also, we work with patients who can't speak. We're often underpaid. We are certainly under-resourced. We have to find our own funding in most cases. We experience high patient mortality. And there's high attrition with rehabbers. I looked at a study that looked at um, over 360 rehabilitators. And um, most rehabbers don't continue through their first year. Um, so bravo to all of you sitting here who have been rehabbing for either one year or for your whole lifetime. Um, you are doing amazing work. And so all the things, this is hard, right? So why do we do it? Well, I'll bet if I were to ask any of you um, in the audience today why you do it, I, I'll bet many of you would answer that it, simply because they exist. They're living, breathing creatures that... Um, have their own life experience, they have their bonds to conspecifics, they each have a will to live, they each deserve to not feel pain, and all living things are intrinsically connected. Um, um, interestingly, some of you may have heard that um, in the past year, a few countries have actually adopted um, laws stating that nature ha has a legal right to exist. And so this is Panama, Ecuador, Bolivia, they believe, and I wrote down a quote, that the natural world and wildlife are unique, um, indivisible, and self-regulatory communities of beings that deserve protection. Um, also, with all the harm we're doing in the world, isn't our ethical responsibility to make these wrongs right? And then finally, where else would these animals go? If we weren't there taking care of them, where would they go? And then I know that some of you, oops, um, so again, some of you would respond that I take care of wildlife simply because they exist and deserve a second chance. And I just loved these quotes, which are a wonderful reminder that the earth was made for all beings, not just human beings, but also no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever, ever wasted. I'm a huge fan of mice, by the way, if you didn't know that already. <laughs> um, and then... Of course, many of us rehab animals because of this. I love these photos. These are two thick build mers that were just recently released and they literally look as though they're dancing to the water. This one is like, hey, wait for me. <laughs> Don't leave without me. Um, and so all of us, we really want, we want to help these animals and get them back out into the wild, capable of independent survival and living their lives. This is probably why we all really do it. 
We also uh, rehabilitate wildlife because the need is tremendous. And you all know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but our contact uh, between human and wildlife grows daily. Our footprint on them is enormous. Um, and when humans and wildlife collide, wildlife often suffers. So we get to give a chance um, to animals to live again and be free. Okay, so I feel this discussion requires um, some knowledge of the history of wildlife rehab. Where did we start? Where did we begin and where have we come? And so this is really fascinating. Um, the history of wildlife rehab really was sparked by two major historical events. Um, if you look back in time, there were um, non-structured uh, wildlife rehab um, groups, people, largely individuals who are rehabbing wildlife. Um, but then two major events took place. In 1969, the Union Oil drilling platform that was located six miles off Santa Barbara on the California coast had a huge blowout. This spilled over 4 million gallons of crude oil, absolutely devastating to this coastline, which is so rich in biodiversity. There was over 35 miles of coastline impacted. And what happened was all these birds were washing up oils and other marine life. And you had um, you know, untrained individuals, kind, compassionate individuals who wanted to help. And I feel like this photo is a great representation. Here we have an oil spill and they're washing the bird with no gloves on no appropriate PPE, uh, working with hazardous chemicals. People wanted to help. Um, and so this was um, started a major shift where people started thinking about animals, um, not just in the wild and not just animals in, the, in captivity, but how do we help animals? Um, how do we save them and make sure they go on to lead productive lives? And so even Nixon had uh, quoted that this event as sad as it was, it really touched the conscience of the American people and shifted an environmental consciousness. Meanwhile, uh, Lindsay Rehabilitation Hospital, which was formerly the Lindsay Wildlife Museum, they had started as a small natural history center and they began to see with um, you know, more people moving into the Bay Area, they saw an increased need to take in injured wildlife. And so in 1970, they became one of the first formalized rehab centers in the United States. They now have a huge center and museum um, and rehab hospital, and they refer to themselves as the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. I had uh, the great fortune of doing some work with them when I worked in California. And why they are important is because the second major event that happened in um, our wildlife rehab history was in 1971. Sadly, we had a second major spill, the San Francisco Bay oil spill. And, you know, you might be thinking, and it's true, uh, that sometimes it takes really horrific events. We have to hit rock bottom before we make changes. And so this was rock bottom. We had a collision of two standard oil tankers that released over 840,000 gallons of oil into San Francisco Bay, which you all know is um, another area that's very rich in biodiversity. Again, there, were, there was response from untrained citizens, Lindsay Wildlife Hospital, which was now the only formalized wildlife hospital, and also the Richmond Bird Care Center, which uh, went on to become IBR, which I'm sure you all know, International Bird Rescue Center. So you can see how 1969 and 71, those two spills were a significant milestone in the history of rehab. It woke people up. Oh my God, what happens when there's an ecological disaster? Who takes care of the animals and how? So these disasters brought like-minded people together. Here's another photo of people working with biohazard uh, material, washing a grebe with no gloves on, but they wanted to help. So this is pivotal here. The oil spills, intense urban growth and loss of native habitat, especially in uh, California, inspired a group of individuals in 1971 to form an association for people interested in caring for wildlife. They got together and said, there are no standards for wildlife, we need them. There are no support networks, we need them. Um, and incredibly, this is what um, sparked what was the Bay Area Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, um, which ended up 
the history is slightly unclear here, but I believe they then became the International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council, IWRC, founded in California. The rest is history. And look at how far we've come. Um, we've come a really long way. Okay, so as rehabbers, um, you probably hear this phrase. This is one of my biggest pet peeves in my life is when I hear people say, I saw a bird laying on the beach, but I decided to just leave it there and let nature take its course. Think about this, in this day and age with all of our impact on animals, is there really such a thing as nature taking its course? Um, here's a prime example. I love this image. This is a razor bill laying on a Cape Cod beach in the winter. For those of you who know birds, you know that a razor bill should not be on a beach on Cape Cod in the winter. They're a pelagic bird. But also I think about, imagine if people just walked by and said, oh, that bird is sick, I'm just gonna leave it. If you look closely, this bird is oiled, okay? And so to me, that's, um, you know, oil is not part of nature taking its course. And that's valuable information that we can gain by retrieving that bird. This is an environmental contaminant. And so what I tell people is um, nature is trying to take its course, but unfortunately we're in the way. And here I have a gull who had swallowed a fish hook and a squirrel who was shot. And we all know that the impacts on wildlife are immense. And I apologize for the graphic images. This is a box turtle, by the way, who was um, hit by a car and was no longer living on Route 6 on Cape Cod. So the impacts, the footprint on wildlife is enormous. There's habitat loss, habitat degradation, lead, mercury poisoning, rodenticides, cats, light pollution, window strikes, vehicle collisions, illegal shooting, human possession, climate change. Um, these animals need a break. World wildlife populations are in decline, you guys, in a massive, massive way. Um, we've lost nearly 70% of our global wildlife in the past 50 years. 50 years is a, just a, um, a little blink in time, and we've lost so much. Just our backyard birds, our beloved um, cardinals and blue jays, we've seen a 26% decline in 50 years. Two in three North American bird species are currently at increasing risk of climate extinction. Wild mammals have declined by 85% worldwide since the rise of humanity. In 2021, over 22 animals were declared extinct. In 2021, um, while we were struggling with COVID, animals were also having their struggles. In our lifetime, all of us sitting here, we will see mass extinction. Um, and this photo, is sad, as sad as it is, it was from two years ago, um, a northern uh, uh, perula, which is a type of warbler, this was a window strike during a migratory fallout. And I'm happy to report that this bird actually recovered in my staff's care and we were able to release it and send it on its way. So in less than a single human's lifetime, in less than 50 years, we've lost nearly 3 billion birds just from the United States and Canada. And I had to share these because they're, they almost bring tears to my eyes. It's, it's staggering, it's, all, it's unfathomable, um, but we are helping and we can help. So this represents a staggering loss that suggests that the very fabric of North America's ecosystem is unraveling. Unra and I think this photo alone speaks a million words. So every time we lose a species, we break a life chain that has evolved over 3.5 billion years. Think about that. Okay, so the other end of the spectrum wildlife rehabbers is people might say, oh my God, why the heck are you, why do you rehab squirrels? Why do you rehab mice and voles and gulls? They're everywhere. Why don't you just focus on, you know, these endangered species, these species that are in massive decline? Well, that's when I like to remind people that um, those animals are now everywhere, but so was the passenger pigeon, which I think is the most extraordinary example. Uh, the passenger pigeon was once the most abundant bird on the planet. In the early 1800s, there were billions of passenger pigeons in North America, and it was stated that they actually blackened the skies for days when they passed over in flocks. There were so many birds that no one ever thought that they would ever, their population would be compromised in, 
any way. And so the slaughter began and deforestation began. These were pigeons of the forest. Um, they, were, they were foraging and also breeding in the forest and very dependent on a forest habitat for protection. And so people came to learn that these pigeons are very valuable. They can be sold at the market for food. They can be used for their feathers. And these birds were slaughtered. They were hunted, they were trapped, they were baited. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a box of tissues, I highly recommend reading Hope is the Thing with Feathers. It details um, the extinction of several species in North America. So anyway, um, the slaughter continued and um, what happened was no one started noticing that these birds were decreasing until the 1860s. What was also happening was their forests were being um, taken down um, by, by, um, because of the settlers and so these pigeons no longer had forests to live in so they were moving to agricultural areas where they were eating the farmers crops and then being shot all odds against them. So what happened was in 1878, we had the last large nesting colony of passenger pigeons in the United States and market hunters found this colony and they were killing over 50,000 birds per day. There were no conservation efforts, you guys, until the 1880s. Imagine all this time passed until we finally had, um, between 1909 and 1912, the American Ornithological Union actually offered um, these rewards of $1,500 to anyone who could find a nest or a colony of a passenger pigeon so that they could be protected. Efforts were futile, they found none. The last capture of a wild bird to put it in captivity to, for breeding program was in, um, March of 1900. At this time, there were only a few birds in captivity. And then sadly, the last living passenger pigeon in the Cincinnati Zoo, her name was Martha, this gorgeous bird right here. She was named after Martha Washington. Um, she was the very last of her species, a species that was once so abundant, they blackened the sky. And Martha died on September 1st of 1914 at the ripe age of 29. Never again would man witness the magnificent spring and fall migratory flights of this swift and graceful bird. So I talked a lot about the passenger pigeon right there. And so what has the passenger pigeon taught us? The passenger pigeon has taught us that the time to protect a species is while it's still common. Um, what we are doing rehabbing individuals is so critically important. As rehabbers, we are on the front lines of understanding the impacts that we face, and it's up to us what we do with that information to help to try to protect them and make a difference. In the 1800s, they didn't have the knowledge base, the databases, the technology, the phones for sharing information. We have that now. Um, and so our actions directly impact wildlife, and that can be in a negative or a positive way. And each animal that we treat teaches us more about their biology so we can better help um, the next one that we get in and also help um, to protect a species. Okay, so back to the common animals, the pests, why do we rehab them? I'm just going to give you one quick example you know, when people say to me, why do you take care of voles? They destroy my lawn. I hate them. <laughs> um, I think about this single animal that everyone thinks of as a pest, a meadow vole. They're everywhere. They are important prey animals. You can see here that a single barn owl may eat um, six voles a night. Um, barn owl families can consume over 3,000 voles and other small rodents in a breeding season. In Eastern Europe and Poland in particular, the red fox diet is largely comprised of voles. Everything eats voles. If you're a vole, life is really hard. Predation is high and life is short. Their lifespan is like three months because they are predated. So aside from being a really tasty morsel for most creatures on the planet, uh, they're also critically important for the distribution of seeds and aeration of topsoil. These are burrowing and tunneling animals. While they're burrowing and tunneling, they're depositing rich fecal pellets everywhere. Here's another cool thing. With such a short lifespan, I'm not surprised 
I wasn't surprised to learn that um, voles exhibit empathy. I learned that voles that have been mistreated actually receive more grooming from the other voles. And why is this fascinating? This is fascinating because this is a little creature in your backyard. Empathy was thought to be reserved for the, the higher beings, the elephants, the humans, the apes. And here we are, this little pest that everyone is trying to um, eradicate from their yard exhibits empathy in their, um, you know, in their burrowing tunnels. Okay, so what would happen if voles disappear? Uh, I did some research and certainly because they're such an important prey animal, predatory species would decline. Predatory species would now probably need to shift and put immense pressure on some other small prey species who may not be able to sustain that. Um, predators might now need to shift to eating larger prey that have slower reproductive strategies, and that may not be sustainable for those larger prey. Plant cultivation would surely decline. We don't have these little animals aerating the soil. So I hope you can see how eliminating one small creature could have a profound impact on the environment as we know it. Basically, if we get rid of the voles, the world's going down, okay? <laughs> also, please wear gloves when you're handling wildlife. <laughs> okay, so this brings me to uh, the bigger picture and how um, rehabbers are making, really making a difference. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the One Health paradigm, uh, which basically states that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all interconnected. And we should all be working together and communicating with one another to achieve the best possible health outcomes for people, animals, plants, and the environment. What impacts animals impacts us. They are the canaries in the coal mine. And so at Wildcare, um, you know, we are... Uh, one center and um, small center compared with many others. Um, but what we do as soon as we see something that is out of the norm of what we usually see, or if we have any questions, we share that information. We reach out to fellow rehabbers. We reach out to the state. We reach out to the feds. And this is very, very helpful for wildlife um, because we are on the front lines as rehabbers of understanding emerging diseases, environmental impacts, disasters. Um, also, rehabbing animals helps us to better understand um, their life cycles and their longevity and their distribution. This was just an example of in uh, 2017, we started seeing, I think we took in, um, it ended up being over 23 northern gannets who were all showing neurological symptoms. Um, and ultimately, um, after some of these birds were tested, they found that these birds had cyanobacterial exposure. And so, you, you know, this is a way that we like to contribute. Even deceased animals are valuable. And so as human populations expand, we are living in closer contact with wildlife, which allows more opportunities for disease. Disruptions in the environment provide new opportunities for disease to pass to wildlife, but also there's a in marked increase in the movement of people and animals, which can also lead to new or emerging diseases and zoonotic diseases, diseases that impact people. Um, and guess who sees all of that firsthand? We do. We're the ones getting the animals um, from, from our finders or off the beaches, and uh, we are the first to see it. Here is a brilliant example that I'm so happy to share. Um, to me, wildlife rehabilitators are sentinels of wildlife disease. And so I reached out to several people and asked, um, why do you feel that wildlife rehabbers are valuable? And I got some wonderful um, heartfelt feedback. And I need to read this quote from Ann Ballman. She is with USGS, wildlife, she's a wildlife disease specialist. And she said, wildlife rehabilitators are disease sentinels. A great example of this is the first confirmation of bat white nose syndrome in Washington state. A single sick little brown bat was taken to pause where the veterinarian, who's also a wildlife rehabber, recognized that there was some sort of infection on its wings and alerted Washington um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, who then contacted our lab for testing. This discovery from the single bat represented a significant expansion of where we knew the disease to be and resulted in increased surveillance in Western states. 
And I just got chills because it can't be better stated that this one, this one animal where one rehabber noticed that something was a little different and alerted, um, you know, alerted the lab uh, is leading to increased protection for this species. It's just incredible. And I know, so, and this is for everyone, whether you're a large center or an individual at WildCare, we don't have any funding to test anything. So the first thing we do if we feel something's wrong is I reach out to the state or the feds and say, would you like to test this? And we're happy to package it. We want to provide the info. Um, and so you can do the same. I also love, I reached out to Drew Vitz, our, our state ornithologist with Mass Wildlife, and I said, tell me, um, what do you find is the value of wildlife rehabbers and wildlife rehabilitation? And his response was, I completely support your thought that wildlife rehabilitators are often on the front lines, especially along the lines of disease, toxins, or any large scale mortality event. Much of what we know about second generation anticoagulant rodenticide impacts on bird populations comes from birds brought into rehabilitators. Reports from wildlife rehabilitators have been useful in determining disease outbreaks like West Nile virus and documenting the mystery bird illness from last year, which was found in over 11 states. Documenting lead in loons is another case where rehabbers have been particularly helpful. There's also the educational benefit of the work that you all do. And I'm just gonna go through a few other quick examples of things that we responded to. Um, and also we were not, WildCare was not the only ones to respond. Um, of course, um, other rehab centers like the Cape Wildlife Center and Tufts and New England Wildlife Center and also independent rehabbers throughout the state responded to these events. We had a Newcastle's disease event in 2000, summer of 2018, uh, where we responded to 57 sick and ailing cormorants. Um, the Cape Wildlife Center had submitted samples and they found out that these birds did ha indeed have uh, the Newcastle's virus. And so we served as eyes on the ground for mass wildlife, taking these birds out of the environment and also providing useful information on the distribution of the virus and the possible etiology. Where did this start from? We believe it started in Provincetown. There's a breeding colony there. Um, HPAI, which is avian influenza, unfortunately it is here. I'm sure you've heard uh, the news. Uh, WildCare just had two geese that were the first positive wild birds in Massachusetts. Um, and so this to me also is a prime example. Uh, my staff noticed some strange symptoms. Um, we wrote to Mass Wildlife, Mass Wildlife tested them. And if it wasn't for wildlife rehabbers, we wouldn't even know that many of these threats exist in the environment. The common eider is another uh, wonderful example. So many rehabbers have contributed data to uh, researchers studying the Well Felipe novel virus and Jeremy Point virus. Uh, Andrew Allison is the lead on that project. And from all of your contributions of blood samples and cadavers, um, he had learned that it is an arthropod born, a tick born um, illness in these birds. And I think my last example of a study is a critically important one. I had a wonderful and enlightening discussion with Dr. Pokris um, from Tufts University. For um, 34 years, they have been looking at um, common loons, um, and this includes doing um, you know, field work, doing taking assessing blood work and doing necropsies. They've looked at lead poisoning and aspergillosis, amongst other things. And um, they actually just passed their 4,000 carcass mark of having necropsied over 4,000 carcasses. And while that's sad, all of those individual animals provided really important information. Um, what they have learned is that the number one threat to adult loons in the Northeast is lead poisoning. And this is the kind of information that inspires action, inspires change at the legislative level. Um, Mark Pokris said that rehabilitators are undervalued um, and sometimes they don't realize the value of contributing data. Authorities can make management decisions that are informed by rehabilitators. He also said to me something I hadn't thought of. We have access to all this information because we're the first one to get these animals. Many agencies, they can't share their data. 
We can. Sharing is caring. Okay, so wildlife rehab, it benefits individuals and it provides opportunities. Um, wildlife rehab supports conservation medicine approaches. It provides us opportunities to monitor wildlife health. It increases our scientific understanding of the species. Each animal re we receive teaches us more about their biology and their behave behavior, which better helps us to provide care for the next one. So as rehabbers, you probably also get the question, um, does rehab help or hinder wildlife populations? Well, I first have to start by saying that um, I found this amazing article online, which I referenced here, uh, the journal in the Journal for Conservation, oops, Nature. It's called Population Level Effects of Wildlife Rehab and Release Vary with Life Strategy History. I highly recommend that you look that up. What they did was they looked at um, five different species and they did an analysis. Um, they projected uh, in 200 years, if those five species were rehabilitated at a certain level, what would happen and would this make a difference? So back to the question, does wildlife rehab help or hinder wildlife populations? Wildlife rehab helps the individuals. Wildlife rehab also can stabilize some endangered populations. When we're talking about endangered populations of animals with critically low levels, every individual is so important to that population. Wildlife rehab can reduce endangered animals' um, chance of local extinction, extirpation. The study found that rehab is most likely to benefit species with slow life history strategies. So animals like turtles or bats, animals that only nest once per year or have young once per year. And then some people might say to you, well, why are you taking care of all these animals? They're, they're the misfits. They wouldn't have survived anyway. And you all know that, um, you know, my response to that is we're not putting extra animals into the environment. We're putting animals back that were already in the environment who were struggling because they were impacted by people in some way. Uh, the bottom line is that wildlife simply cannot evolve as rapidly as the pressures we put upon them. And there are so many examples of animals evolving to meet our pressures, but they can't evolve as rapidly. And by the way, this little plover chick here, this is when it first came in and we gave it some a plush family. And this is when the chick was hydrated up and running around and has a watchful, um, a, a plush plover dad <laughs> watching over it. Uh, that chick was reintroduced to its parents. So wildlife rehab, it encourages stewardship. And um, we are meeting an ethical obligation to provide compassionate care to other living things. And as you already know, it helps us to identify uh, human impact. The study also stated that rehab efforts, they do not divert resources or hinder populations. Uh, you know, sometimes I've been doing this work for a long time. So some people will say to me, I think rehab is a waste of money. We should just be focusing on land conservation for the animals, endangered species, um, and actually the study found that rehabilitation efforts, they do not divert resources um, that could be used for in situ conservation work like um, captive, captive uh, breeding programs and conservation work. In fact, the study stated that rehabbers are um, an underutilized resource and that rehabilitation efforts should be combined with these captive breeding programs and conservation work. And rehab efforts do not hamper conservations of wild populations. Unless you're putting out extremely sick individuals or individuals with a new, you know, with a, with a virus that they contracted in your facility, uh, we are not hampering wild populations. And last for this study, um, wildlife rehab is especially helpful in the area of endangered species. And again, species with slow reproductive life strategies. I loved this research paper. It was, it was brilliant. It was everything that I've been preaching <laughs> and now to see it on paper. Um, and again, they did a statistical model. Um, so it wasn't based in, in um, reality, but they felt that it was pretty true to life, life looking at 
over 200 years for various um, three species. Okay, so you as rehabbers, I just told you for the last 40 minutes how important you are. Now is the time to use um, your voice. And there's no better time with this global pandemic, pandemic that we're going into year three, um, we are amidst a global mental health crisis. And in the past two and a half years, more people than ever have turned to nature to help them. Um, wildlife in nature is good for our health. It creates a sense of wonderment and awe, a feeling of privilege. Imagine when you see a bird and no one else is around you and you feel so privileged to be in the presence of that creature. Um, nature and wildlife remind us um, of central awakening, a time to be still, contemplation, spiritual fulfillment, a feeling of well-being, a feeling of belonging to something that is more than us. An ancient human longing comes with um, viewing and working with nature and wildlife. And one heartening consequence of the pandemic was uh, bird watching. So unbelievably, and this is so, so wonderful, all of our restrictions and shutdowns with COVID made people be more present and recognize that there's been birds all around us. Birds have been singing, um, birds have been breeding, they're present and they can enrich our lives. They're good for our health. Uh, the numbers are astounding. During the pandemic, bird seed and bird feeder sales increased by 45 to 50%. More people were reporting their bird sightings. On Wiki, People had visited Blue Jays 44,000 times pre-pandemic, oops, and 85,000 times in 2020 during the pandemic. Birds and wildlife are good for our health and also for our economy. Um, aside from the intrinsic value that wildlife brings to us, there is a global economy of well, billions and billions of dollars um, for people who want to see wildlife. Um, I want you to think about it for a minute. Why do you rehab wildlife and how do you feel when you see wildlife, whether it's an animal that comes to you um, or an animal that you're seeing in the wild? So what does wildlife and wildlife rehab teach us as humans? Um, and these are all subjective things, by the way, um, but here are some of the things that come to mind of what wildlife has taught me. Uh, certainly it's taught me compassion, patience, living in the now. Animals know nothing other than the now. We are all connected. Humans aren't that different from animals. It teaches us responsibility, respect for our elders, careful listening, living lightly, and that we all must stick together. Um, people need wildlife more than, um, well, uh, as much as they need us. And so you all know how valuable you are, whether you are rehabbing, you know, 10 baby squirrels a year or 10,000 baby squirrels a year, you make a difference. You are the voice for those who cannot speak with words. Wildlife rehabbers um, make a difference in the life of an animal and also make the difference in the life of a person. Just think about children, especially how malleable they are and they're able to retain information and they share it abundantly. They don't hold back. Um, we can teach people so easily um, the value of their small actions and how much of a difference they can make to wildlife. And my point of showing you all that info about the global pandemic is just that we are in a climate right now where people want that information. There's so much bad happening in the world. They want to hear from us. And you have the voice as a rehabber. You have the knowledge to share. And they are listening. So Jennifer Longstorff um, from the Mass Wildlife Natural Heritage Program, um, I asked her, um, why do you believe wildlife rehabilitators are important? And her response was that wildlife rehabbers serve as ambassadors between wildlife and the community. They provide critical education and advice to the public and other stakeholders to help reduce human wildlife conflict. Additionally, they provide guidance on times when an animal may need intervention versus when animals should be left alone. 
Sharing is caring. Share with your fellow rehabbers. Um, you have a special case, a special success, a question, uh, share with your fellow rehabbers. If you see something weird, you see a trend, stare, share with your rehabbers, share with the state, share with the feds. I can guarantee you are not, they are not going to um, turn you away. It's important information. Uh, we raise awareness about the animals around us and even the deceased have value. Imagine back in the 70s when we had those two ecological disasters which inspired a rehab group to form. Imagine if they didn't share their knowledge where we would be. It would be very different times. I also want you to remind yourself, you know, there's such thing as our release rate and then there's our success rate. And I say that our success rate as rehabbers is 100%. So if you have lost one of your animals and you are feeling down about it, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Did you try your best? Did you alleviate suffering? Did you make the animal comfortable? Did you learn more about that animal which will better help you to provide care for the next one? If you can answer yes to all these questions, which I'm certain you can, your success rate to me is 100%. And then there are some bonus questions. Did your experience with this animal contribute to a knowledge base? Did you share it with the rehabber? Did you inspire awareness or advocacy for this species? Then you are definitely, you're 110% if you can answer um, <laughs> those questions. Every animal matters and every wildlife rehabber matters. And that's for all of us, um, everyone. I know people are, are joining from every state and I'm so proud of you because I know about your tireless work. Um, we can make a positive difference for wildlife, all of us, and it's through our conscious effort for, to reduce our big footprint that we pave the way um, for their smaller footprints and ultimately towards a healthier planet. Oh, and I think I skipped a slide or I lost a slide. Oh, I skipped a slide, excuse me. I just want to share that. Um, so whether you are an at-home rehabber um, doing your important work or you are a big center taking over 5,000 animals a year, you can do public outreach and education. And it doesn't have to be formalized programs. It can be as simple as posting, making a social media post a couple of times a week or responding to your phone calls um, when people find animals and responding in a positive way. I find that people don't want to be preached to. No one wants to be told what to do. Um, so storytelling, I think, is really, really helpful, can be really key. Um, if you share a story about an animal, even if it didn't um, survive in your care, there are lessons to be learned there and everyone is listening. Um, social media, we're so lucky because we have far, far reaching capabilities with a social media. Um, so keep doing your great work, mitigating threats to wildlife, reducing your uh, human negative interactions, and also preventing wildlife from coming to you when they don't need to be, preventing over rescues. Okay, so I would like to end my presentation with this beautiful, beautiful uh, poem that I think sums up this presentation beautifully, and it's called The Starfish. So, an old man walked along a shore littered with thousands of starfish beached and dying after a storm. A young girl was picking them up and flinging them back into the ocean. Why do you bother, the old man asked. You're not saving enough of them to make a difference. The young girl picked up another starfish and sent it spinning back to the water and said, it made a difference to that one. And you are making a difference for every single animal you bring in and also to every single person um, who brings in the animals. So keep up your amazing work. I want to say thank you so much for attending. I have my information here, but I also have a thank you slide to the kind, wonderful in individuals who really helped me on this presentation. And I apologize that I didn't have room to put in all your titles, but um, these are good peeps and I appreciate their help. I also need to thank my amazing staff who work tirelessly 365 days a year uh, to help wildlife. I love you guys. All right. Thanks, Stephanie, for that wonderful inspirational talk. That was a great way to kick off the uh, conference. Um, I did 
tell Stephanie that I would go long for this presentation because I knew I was taking up some of her time. So we are going to stay on to answer some of your questions. Um, if you guys have questions for Stephanie, you can type them in the Q&A tab um, located on your Whova screen. And um, I know Stephanie will be happy to answer some questions for the next 10 minutes. Um, that will still give you guys some time between this and the next agenda session starting at 1015. So Stephanie, you ready for your questions? I am. Should I stop my screen share or keep it here? You can, whatever you'd like. It doesn't matter because okay, we can I'll see keep... your lovely face anyway. <laughs> um, okay. So the first question was asked by Michaela. Um, oh, let's just see. She said, will you be posting this PowerPoint afterwards? I will definitely look into the book. Hope is this the thing with feathers. Yes, I'm hoping actually with Whitney's permission, I'd like to put this recording on Wildcare's YouTube page so people can watch it. But I also, I can make this into a PDF and send it to people if you would like to email me. That might okay. be the easiest right now to get the information out. Yes, of course you can post it to Wildcare. And again, <laughs> um, Michaela, you will have access to the recording. Um, so you'll have that um, for up to three months. And then if you're a member, um, they'll be posted sometime next this at the end of this year. So you'll have them forever. Um, so you do have access many ways. Um, the next question is from Julie. As a wildlife rehabilitator, did you ever feel like the only reason they have us around is to keep the numbers up for the trapping and hunting licenses? Um, that is a great question. I have personally never felt that way. I think if anything, um, you know, all of us are providing a really important public safety service for the state, which the state does not have the resources or the bandwidth to do. So if anything, I would say they are utilizing us more in that capacity. Uh, you know, things like hunting, um, like uh, hunting waterfowl, for example, I believe that's largely dictated by uh, USDA, the feds, because these are migratory birds and they're looking at um, breeding bird surveys of these birds um, to then determine bag li limits, et cetera working with state agencies. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say no, I don't think so. I certainly hope not. <laughs> All right, the next question is um, from Jillian. Just wondering, general opinion, where do you think rehabilitators should fall on the spectrum of conservation, including sustainable use of some wildlife species and animal welfare, animal rights? Sure. Um, where? What was the first part of the question again? I'm sorry. Where do you think rehabilitators should fall on the spectrum of conservation and animal welfare and animal rights? Um, it honestly, I think we are right up there in the top tier. And again, that's because who knows better what the animals are facing in the wild? Who knows better than us? No one. Um, you know, even field field researchers. Um, they're working with healthy animals. They're not seeing, often working with healthy animals, they're not seeing the impacts that wildlife face. So who better to speak about those impacts? And I think, and to speak to Mark Popers's, um quote that he made, we are an undervalued resource. And he feels that the scientific community should be having, should be having more discussions with rehabbers um, about these types of things. That's a fantastic question. Okay, the next one is from Matthew. He's asking, where did you get the design for your aviary? Oh, yes. So the large elliptical aviary, that actually is um, a replication of an aviary at Avian, Avian Haven in Maine. We loved their facility. We love that um, the outer pen. It's so important. And so it's it's a it's a duplicate. We took they shared their design and we recreated it. I think it was um, that was in 2007 ish and it was like a ninety thousand dollar project. Wow. Wow. Now it is a great design. I've seen it in a couple other places, too. Um, OK, next question is from Susan. You mentioned bird feeders, but do you think they sometimes cause more harm than good? Bird feeders, another great question. There's so much controversy. No, I don't think that bird feeders cause harm. Uh, and the reason for that is because we often like to think that, you know, when birds are at our bird feeder, we think that's the only place they're eating and they're not. 
Um, they're, they're getting everything they need from the wild. And then our bird feeders are a supplement. Where we get into trouble is um, when birds do congregate in these areas. And so there's opportunity for disease spread. So we always stress it's critically important, you know, especially now with avian flu, critically important to make sure every week you're cleaning your bird bats and your bird feeders with bleach um, to make sure you're preventing the spread of disease. But I don't think, you know, saying, just like people saying hummingbirds aren't going to migrate if you leave your bird feeders up. That is simply not true. They are responding to um, environmental cues, the increase in photo period, um, you know, changes in hormones related to the environment. And so bird feeders can, can change their patterns, but not in a negative way. I hope that all makes sense. It did to me. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, last question from Anne. For newcomers to the field of wildlife rehabilitation, what do you recommend for critical introductory experiences and information? Critical introductory experiences. I would say if you have the resources, if you are able financially, I always tell people to please volunteer at a wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, and because there is where you're going to get real hands-on experience in the trenches and see if that's a field of work that works for you. Um, other than that, um, resources that are up to date, I would say National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, um, International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council. Those are two great groups who their focus is to provide standards of wildlife rehab and support wildlife rehabbers. Um, but definitely reaching out to your local rehab center. That's how I started my career uh, over, oh my God, almost 20 years ago. I can't believe it, but I, I've always loved animals and I would find baby birds and I would try to take care of them. And many of them wouldn't survive. And then someone told me to take my birds to Kathy Frisbee, who's been a rehabber in Massachusetts for a very long time. Kathy Frisbee recommended that I volunteer at the New England Wildlife Center and get my rehab permit. I volunteered at the New England Wildlife Center, which was then in Hingham, and Dr. Mertz ended up hiring me. He saw my passion, especially for birds. He hired me, and the rest is history. <laughs> I'm so grateful. So, um, but I realize not everyone has the financial ability to be able to volunteer, but I would say, get in there. You're really gonna know if this work is for you. All right, Steph, well, that's the last question. Thank you for, again, a wonderful um, presentation. You got some um, props in the chat section. We said, you know, Courtney said, mic drop, Steph, amazing talk. Um, <laughs> Loretta said a beautiful voice for wildlife. Thank you. Karen was like, what a great presentation. Thank you for warming my heart. Aww. Jillian was like, holy cannoli. Stephanie, you are the best. What a cheerleader for all of us, et cetera, et cetera. So check out those chats after, your, after you get out of here. Um, thank you everyone for joining our keynote speaker. I hope it kicked off the weekend of um, wonderful inspirational lectures. Um, take some time, five minutes, um, do what you got to do, grab a snack and join us for our next talks that are coming up. We will have, um, you know, some raccoon stuff. We'll have some opossum stuff, et cetera, et cetera. It's all good stuff. Um, I hope you guys have fun and I will see you next uh, in my next moderation if you join it or tomorrow at lunch for our presentation. But in the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone. Talk Thanks, soon. everyone.